Good morning and welcome to Croydon's Sabbath School panel. It's been a little while since I've been sat in this chair, so I apologize in advance if I uh, get a bit ring rusty. But it's wonderful to be in God's house and to be able to study his word together on this holy Sabbath day. I don't know what kind of week you've had. I don't know what kind of crucible you may have been in. But we just want to thank God that we can be together here on this Sabbath day. A special shout out as usual to those who are tuning in from abroad, especially those that are getting up extra early in the morning. Um, but as usual, this is not a solo effort, this is a team effort, and we want to hear from you. If you're on Adventist Radio London or on Life Radio or via YouTube or live stream, whatever platform you are tuning in on, we want to hear from you this morning because it's an interactive service. So just a reminder, if you are tuning in um, via YouTube or live stream and you don't have a quarterly, uh, you will see a website appear where you can download a copy of uh, the quarterly or the study guide um, to follow along if you don't have one to hand. Um, also, if you, are want, if you want to make your comments and send in your questions, just do it on the chat as usual. For those on the radio, Adventist Radio London, you get in touch by sending uh, a text to 8228, leave a space, put the word hope, and then your message, remember, charges apply. But you can also send in a message via the email address, which is studio at adventistradio.london. And if you're on Life Radio, your email address is studio at liferadio.uk. And the WhatsApp number for you is 073114094409. It's good to have Sister Marcia Lewis back with us, who is going to champion all the comments. Good morning to you, Marcia. Good morning, Brother Saul. Good morning, worldwide audience. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see you. Good to be with you today. Also, welcome back, um, Sister Sita Zulu, who is no stranger to us, one of our young people. So good morning to you, Sister Sita. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you. Thank you. And now, as mentioned, you know, I recognize that, that get up extra early. And so for the first time, we have a guest pastor. His name is Pastor Andres Malcolm. He is the son of uh, brother and sister Malcolm, the brother of Michaela Mal Malcolm, and a son of Croydon. And it's lovely to have you with us this morning. Good morning, Pastor Andres. A pleasant good morning to you all. Good to have you joining us this morning. So we are going to dig into the study of God's Word, but before we do that, Sister Marcia, perhaps you can just have a prayer at this time to open God's Word. Sure. Let's pray. Oh, kind, merciful, loving Father, Lord, we are just so grateful for the Sabbath day, an opportunity for us to, to be in your presence, Lord, and to also share with one another the things that your Holy Spirit would have spoke to us in terms of the lesson. Father, continue to be with us, Lord. Help us to ensure that our minds are always in tune with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So we're at lesson number six in our study, In the Crucible with Christ. Powerful lessons, probably lessons that many of you may have associated with. And today we're looking at struggling with all energy. The memory verse for this week is taken from Colossians chapter 1 verse 29. And the New International Version says, to this end I strenuously, strenuously contend with all energy. Christ so powerfully works in me. So to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Our Sabbath afternoon's lesson introduction opened with a, a sad story of an unrelated man and an unrelated woman. Um, they're on a talk show. Um, 
they both had children who had been murdered. The woman's son was murdered 20 years earlier, and the man's daughter a few years er, murdered a few years earlier. Truly, they were in a crucible. However, uh, the woman, even after 20 years, burned with anger and bitterness towards the murderer every day. But the father <coughs> spoke of forgiveness for his daughter's killer. Two very different circumstances, with the mother still struggling with all her energy in the crucible, but the father appearing to no longer struggle. So, so Marcia, you know, going back to our title, Struggling with All Energy, and the memory verse, to me, unless you are play fighting, Surely you must struggle strenuously or, or with all your energy. Is it possible, here's my question, is it possible though that some of us who call ourselves Christians still don't understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood? You understand where I'm coming from? Loud and clear. And Brother Johnny, um, absolutely capitalized, emboldened and underscore. Mm -hmm. It is possible there are some of us who are Christians who really don't understand that we're wrestling not against flesh and blood. Take, for example, right now in the UK, in the city of Birmingham, we've got the Commonwealth Games mm -hmm. in which we've got athletes from the countries of the Commonwealth participating in 19 different sports. And they're participating to achieve the prize of being crowned champion in their chosen sport. This competition comes around every four years and in that time, what are the athletes doing? They are putting in hours of training to condition their bodies, ensuring they are eating right, to build and maintain physical strength as well as endurance. Some even go to the extent of employing sports psychologists to help them condition their minds so that they are in the best possible shape to face competition. We as Christians are aiming to win the battle against evil and live a life that is acceptable to God. So along the way of life's journey, we will face challenges. And like the athletes, we need to be prepared, mm. but be prepared spiritually in terms of the hurdles that Satan and these evil agencies will throw at us. Paul says in Colossians 1.29, in the King James Version, that we are to be striving according to his working, mm which means that we have to give the utmost of effort into our Christian journey. We cannot afford to be half-hearted. Mm. Tell me now, anybody see a soldier who goes to war and is not sufficiently armed for his combat? As Christians, we are at war and we need to be sufficiently armed. And we also need to recognize who the enemy is. So some of the challenges we will face in life are going to be tough. They're going to be harsh. And where we see in Ephesians 6.12, when the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, etc. When we meet the opposition of men, there is someone who is behind that opposition. Yes. It is the prince of the power of darkness with his demonic forces who are constantly at work. And our warfare is against those principalities, against those powers, against those rulers of darkness. So we have to make every preparation in our power in order to resist the enemy of souls. Mm. But you know what? God has arranged everything in his plan so that we are not left to our own impulses, to our own finite powers to take on the enemy by ourselves in our own strength. Why? Because we will fail. We have to realize that the enemy would look to confuse our senses with erroneous sentiments and remove the landmarks by placing his false inscription on the signposts that God has established to point the way forward. Let us ensure that our minds are given to the control of God and that we are standing under the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. Amen. My goodness. Um, no more, really, I could say to that. Thank <coughs> you very much. But listeners, viewers, do you agree with what Sister Marcia has said, is it possible some of us who call ourselves Christians still don't understand we wrestle against, we wrestle not 
against flesh and blood. Let's have your, your thoughts and answers to that and thoughts on what Marcia shared with us as well. Thank you. So, moving on. Now, as a good teacher, when Christ was here on, it, on the earth, he tried to prepare his disciples for crucibles they will face in the future. So, Sister Sita, coming to you first of all, what comfort did Jesus share with his disciples in John chapter 16, verses 5 through to 11? If you could just read and comment on that for us, please. Okay, so um, I'll be reading from the New International Version, John 16, verse 5 to 11. But now I'm going to make him who sent me, sorry, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in, him, in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and, uh, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands commanded, condemned. Um, so Jesus knew that his disciples were struggling with the reality of having to let him go um, and they had been with him for a long time and they depended on him. I'm sure they all questioned what they would do without Jesus when the disciples were worrying about not having him to guide them, the Holy Spirit was already in position, ready to take Jesus's place as their advocate, their representative and their counsellor. And Jesus encouraged the disciples to look forward to the coming of the comforter, one who would never leave them and one who can only come if he himself left, if he himself left them. I believe that a really successful teacher makes his or her pupils ready for the inevitable and Jesus did just that. He told his disciples it's for, um, it's for their good that he has to go away. And um, the Holy Spirit will show up in the shortcomings of the world and lead, and lead it into right relationship with God and others and convince it that love alone is the ultimate value on which we'll um, be judged. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. To bring comfort. But Pastor Andres, what else did Christ go on to say in particular um, how he addresses the Holy Spirit? If you could read for us verses 12 to 15 of the same chapter, John 16, and then just, just comment on that, please. Uh, most certainly, Ella Johnny. Uh, reading from the New King James Version, and it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take off what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Um, one of the things that I've seen here is that there are, there are two entities going on. You have the spirit and you have truth. Um, the spirit is God breathing and the truth is coming also from the same source, God himself. And the spirit of God is one who leads us to truth and to all truth. And this is why it's so important that even in Matthew chapter 28, it says, go ye therefore, make disciples, teaching. And, and, and the second aspect to it in verse 19, teaching to observe all things. Mm. Now, God is, has sent his Holy Spirit, not only as a comforter, but as a guide mm. um, for us to understand that through his guidance and care and tutelage, he is the one who will lead us to all truth. Mm, all truth indeed. Sister Sita, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to come back on for that part. Um, yeah, so for me, 
once again, um, Jesus reminds his disciples that everything they're learning comes originally from the Father through the Son and from the Son through the Holy Spirit. And these are not three separate um, revelations, but one message that originates from each one consecutively. Yeah, and, and this concept, I think, of understanding all truth, that's the thing that's deep. You know, we want to know the, the, the right answers. We want to know the way to go. We want the wisdom and the spirit can lead us to all truth. Thank you. Sister Marcia, anything coming in online at the moment or responses to the question? Yes, we've got a couple of responses. Uh, Nigel Archer says, if we don't come to grips with the great controversy, that we are in a life and death battle, mm. we will not see the need to struggle with all our energy and he says, compromise and complacency weakens us. Mm -hmm. So that's one to bear in mind. True. Sun Sun says, as Christians, we need to have the same mentality of athletes. We cannot just go on with daily life and expect to overcome challenges unprepared. Mm. Another comment from Liz Clark, the comfort that Christ left for us is that he'll come again to receive us unto himself. And she says, that's the greatest comfort to me. Um, that's all we've got at the moment, Brother that's Johnny. Okay. That's okay. Keep them coming in. And if there's any members in, in, in our studio as well, happy to hear from you. Any comments that you may have? Let me go out there with another question then at this time. So despite God's omnipotence, God's power, is it possible for us to restrict the Holy Spirit's power? If so, how? So God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. But is it possible for feeble, human, sinful beings like us to restrict the Holy Spirit's awesome power? If so, how? Let's have your thoughts and answers to that. Now, I believe with all my heart that Nothing would happen in my life without God allowing it to happen. I believe he is the person that allows everything in my life to, 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 to take place. But here's the point. Should I then perhaps just sit back and do nothing, seeing it will all happen anyhow? You know, think about that. Yes or no? But let's see. So, Pastor, maybe you can help answer that for us. Um, first, no, Col Colossians 1, verses 28 to 29, and 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Would you say that the Apostle Paul agrees with this approach of just sitting back and doing nothing? If you can read and comment on that, please. Thank you. Okay, no problem. I will first start with Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 and 29, and it says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, with which works in me mightily. And also looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 25, and it says, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, now they do it to be obtained a perishable crown, but we for imperishable crown. So based on observation of reading, uh, Paul basically states that the human effort comes from the preaching and teaching of God in all wisdom of Christ. And through this teaching, um, we, it, it is not gone amiss with, without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit um, plays a very important part on the human effort as not only we're preaching, we're not preaching of ourselves, but we're preaching Christ crucified. And it's very important that we understand that God has enabled us as human beings to speak to human beings through the preaching of the gospel, which needs to and which enables men and women to be guided to all truth and lead men and women unto salvation. 
So preaching, teaching, if I remember correctly from my school days, uh, words that end in ing, they are verbs and verbs are action words. So I, I think the inference there you're saying, Pastor, and what Paul is saying is that there needs to be activity. But l l let's see. Sister Sita, um, Deuteronomy 4, verses 3 to 4. How does this verse further develop this um, divine human combination. In other words, preaching and teaching, you're not doing it on your own, etc. You're working with God. How does uh, Deuteronomy 4, 3 to 4 develop that, please, if you can read. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll still be reading from the New International Version. Um, so it says, You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Babel. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the bow of your but all of you who held fast to the Lord, your God, are still alive today. Um, in these verses, Moses recounts Israel's history of Baal where the Israelites were involved in sinful living, such as idol worship, yoking themselves to foreign women, and the sacrifices of their gods. And consequently, all who participated in the worship of Baal died by a plague. And while this may not be a very pleasant text. It makes a point strongly as to the importance of submitting to God's commands and the negative consequences always follow disobedience to covenant stipulations. Mm, mm. So again, I'm getting this working with God together. Pastor, you got anything to add on what Cetus come in with there? Um, just based on what we have seen, we realize that God must always be at the forefront of our ministry. And in order to be fruitful, we cannot um, do any work effectively without the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's in very imperative that we understand that any preaching and teaching cannot go without the master teacher mm. who is Christ. Mm. It sounds like... Um Again, it's working together and recognizing that you're not in your own strength. We have uh, someone from our congregation, Elder Fibian, that is going to make a point on um, what we've just asked there or, or, or uh, some other point, whatever you want to share with us at this time, Elder Fibian. So we will um, cut over to you shortly. Just give us a moment to just make sure that we've got everything wired up for you. So we are ready, I believe, and we're going to cut over to take Elder Fibian's point any moment. Okay, there we are. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Elder Johnny. Um, you have spoken about the two people initially in the lesson study, a man and a woman who lost their loved ones. And then he the way they manage themselves seems to reflect the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The man is able to bear what happened and the talk of forgiveness, which is probably a fruit of the Holy Spirit, how the Spirit has worked in his life. But the, the woman is still struggling with what happened. She appears to be at a different level in her spiritual growth. Inasmuch as the Lord has promised and given us the Holy Spirit, we notice that there are issues about how we should strive. Mm. Strive with our Lord, with our God, so that it will be found worthy, worthy to be used by the Holy Spirit. For the promise was given to us that the Spirit, the, the Spirit of grace, will come and then it will abide in us forever. Right. That abiding will lead to transformation mm -hmm. of our lives. But then the question is, how shall we be found worthy for the Holy Spirit to abide within us. Mm. And this perhaps is the reason why we might limit the 
presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Mm. Thank you. Good answer. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a point from me on this. Um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 248. It says, many never attain the position that they may occupy because they wait for God to do for them that which he has given them the power to do. So check that, yeah? Where I was saying at the start, you know, should I just sit back and do nothing? God has given us power and authority to do certain things. Um, and it could be we are not achieving what we need to, although God has given us the power to do that. So think, think on those things. Sister Marcy, coming back to you, any comments on um, God's omnipotence being blighted or restricted because of our uh, inability? Sure. In the YouTube, um, we've got Gillette Wainwright. She says, God cannot make us good if we're not willing to change. If I'm a habitual liar and I continually pray, pray to God for change, God would want to change us, but we have to make that effort mm. to wanting the change. Mm. Nigel says, God, uh, the Spirit's power is only as strong as we allow it to be. We must, we must choose to cooperate with him. God is not going to force us to do that which we refuse to do. Liz Clark says, I know God is all-powerful and can give his servants power, but I, I often wonder if anyone is that holy today to receive God's power. Tom Tom says, the power of freedom of choice that God gave us means we have the choice on how much of the Holy Spirit we will allow to work in us, but we cannot limit its power in others. Bev says we restrict the Holy Spirit when we refuse to listen to him. The Holy Spirit is the one whom the Father sent to be with us. Jesus says when the Comforter is come, he will guide us unto all truth. And um, Liz Clark, I think she, she responds to the question um, that was posted earlier. She says, yes, we can restrict the power of God by being her an habitual sinner. Oh. Mm. So in terms of us wondering why, why do we not have the, the power of the Holy Spirit? Why is it that things are not going the way we, we want to? We need to look at our lives mm. and check what it is that we are doing. El Shiko says we can restrict the Spirit's power by the wrong choices we exhibit through our free will. And Pastor Royston Smith says, we need to make ourselves available for the Holy Spirit. We need to open ourselves and make ourselves available, human and divine, working together. Amen. And in the live stream, we have a, a comment, the divine human, I believe with all my heart that nothing will happen in my life without God allowing it to happen. Perhaps I should just sit back and do nothing, seeing it will happen anyway. Hmm. And Karen says, the saying goes, God helps those who help themselves. So it's imperative that we do our part, working hand in hand with God, trusting him to lead us and guide us in all things. And another comment says, we are lacking power because we do not consistently ask. Hmm. Great comments, great comments. Please keep them coming in. And, and thank you, Elder Fibian, uh, too, for your comment there. If you're just joining us on the radio, this is Croydon Sabbath School panel going out to you live. We want to hear from you as well. So here's another question. Um, we'd like you to share an example of where yourself and God successfully worked together to achieve something. What was your role and what was God's part? So think back where yourself and God, you know, worked successfully on something. We, we want some powerful testimonies. Just share with us what your role was and what God's role was. I'm sure that's going to encourage someone. So we look forward to hearing from you on that as well. Now, as far as I know, God created human beings with five senses. And yet, 
some members of the so-called fairer sex feel that they have been endowed with a sixth sense. You may ask them, how come they know that? They just say, I know. I mean, I'm not thinking of anybody particular. This is just a general point I'm making. Okay. So, Sister Sita, just, you know, just coming to you as you were just next um, to be asked. So, I'm, I'm keen to hear your views on this sixth sense. But before that, just remind us of the significance, um, or a significant event, rather, I should say, in our human history of literally where one was just following their gut choice, if I can use that expression. Genesis 3, verse 6, if you could just read and expand, please. Thank you. So Genesis 3, verse 6, I'll be still reading from the New International Version. Um, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Um, you know, as Eve gazed at the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, it's easy to understand why she was drawn to it. The fruit looked really good to the eyes and desirable for wisdom. It was too tempting to resist. And I'm sure many of us can relate to Eve's dilemma as we encounter things that seem good, um, too good to pass up. But in the end, some of those seemingly good things lead us away from the intended path God has for us. And the delight of our eyes and feelings can leave us with a mess of unfavorable consequences. So my assumption is the follow your gut or this, a sixth sense is made from choices based on feelings rather than on God's word. Okay, but you didn't kind of say whether you have this sixth sense or not, but um, okay. I, 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 I don't push. have it. <laughs> I wouldn't push, I wouldn't push. Okay, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Um, so, Pastor, let me just come to you. Expand, if you please, on another well-known example of the perils of following your own feelings. Second Samuel 11, verses 2 through to 4, please. Mm, no problem, Elder Johnny. It reads, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. And he lay with her, but she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Um, it's a very interesting story and quite disheartening for a man of David's ilk and stature, both spiritually as well as physically. And David had reached his lowest point. Um, if you look closely, it was a time where the Bible states that the time when David was at home, it was actually a time when David was supposed to be at war. It was at the spring, a time when men and kings especially would go to war. And in verse one, but for some reason, David saw it fit that he didn't need to go to war, maybe because he had been so victorious in times past that those in whom he are in his ranks are able to deal with the fight. And it is through him being at home where he experienced extreme vulnerability. And it, it's a lesson for us to let us know that <clears throat> even if we might feel weary, there, there are reasons why God asks us to continue the work because he knows what's lurking around the corner, but even despite what had transpired with David, God was still merciful and still showed grace upon him. Um, and this grace is so powerful that it provides a free gift, a provision and a commission um, by God. And even through this terrible situation, something beautiful still came out of it. So um, 
That's why we can't lean on our emotions primarily. This is important why we have to lean upon God. Mm -hmm. He will navigate us in the areas in where we need to go so we can avoid these uncompromising situations. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and another point that kind of jumped out to me about David, we have to recognize that where God has blessed us in the past and where we may have achieved great things, it doesn't make us, um, what's the word I'm looking for? But it, 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 we're, we're, we're still vulnerable to self and still vulnerable to these things. And that, that's the whole point. Um, um, I could see a hand. I'm going to take a hand in a moment. But let just as we get ready to take a, com a comment from um, somebody in our, uh, our studio, let me just go to you, Sister Sita, because we, we want to have an answer to this. So what, what's the solution of, of this, this problem of the um, ill-disciplined will, if I can call it that? First Peter 1 verse 13, what does Peter say? And so he says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And so Peter understood that the mind is a control station where all the action takes place. Mm -hmm. um, in order to not be controlled by feelings, we ought to bring the rationale and reflective powers of our minds under control. Uh, for me, it's, a significant, it's significant that Peter does not give a list of religious acts that will result in holiness. He simply says, change the way you think. And in Romans 12, verse 2, it says that we should not conform to the patterns of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Mm. So the process of being um, holy may be long and difficult, but the destination sounds like a life of peace and restoration. Mm, interesting. Just before I go to Elder Fibian, Pastor, you got anything to come back on? Yes. Um, in light of what was expressed, um, many times when we look at the word grace, we only look at it in one aspect, but it's not only unmerited favor from God, but it also deals with the transformation that God does in the character of hearts who are willing to be transformed. Mm. And that is why it's so important to die to self and grow in grace mm. daily. Yes. Um, if we look at um, uh, James 4, verse 7, it says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. Thank you. Elder Fibian, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Elder. God's plan of salvation is that the Holy Spirit is in us. He is speaking to us every day. Every day, if we reflect on our lives, every situation which comes before us, there are two voices speaking to us. One is a prominent voice. The other one is a small, subdued voice which appears to be in the background. There are two voices every time. That's according to my own experience. Now, we need to pray for this spirit of discernment mm. so that we can hear him. We can hear the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to us every day. I'll give a testimony. I used to work for a company in Hemel Hempstead. Now, next to that company were fuel tanks, fuel storage depot next to that company. Each time I looked at that depot, my heart sank. Mm -hmm. But there I was at work. One Sunday morning, I was required to be at work. But the Spirit of God spoke to me, and I did not go to work. I couldn't explain why I didn't want to go to work, because I was supposed to be at work. And the fuel depot blew up in flames. That was in 2005. I learned a lesson from then on. Then I started reflecting on this small voice every time. And I've noticed that God has 
given me an understanding of this voice. And each time I, I obey this voice, things work out for me. So here we are. The choices we make, there's no excuse for making those choices. Mm. We should do pray for the grace of God to guide us, to listen to him when he speaks to us. Mm. And as we listen, our lives will take shape. Thank you, Elder. Just before you sit, um, Elder Fibian, I just want to press you a little further. Um, you were able to, through that experience, recognize the, the, the voice of, of, of God. But do you think there is something then that enabled you to be able to recognize the voice of God before and after? I'm, I'm kind of leading to what you said earlier about abiding. I'm, I just want you to just expand some more on, on your understanding then that, that that's the voice of God speaking to you. Thank you, Elder. What used to happen before, that voice would speak to me and I would disobey. Mm. Because I would have made up my mind already, then I'm saying, well, I've already made up my mind, I'm going to do this to me, it is going to work, but there is this voice in the background speaking to me. Well, let it speak, but anyway, I know what I want to do, and I went ahead, and I did, and things did not work. Mm. Most times, in fact, all the times, things did not work. So I was growing up mm. spiritually, and every time I was reflecting and questioning myself, how come when I decide to do something, and this voice is constantly speaking to me, and if I disobey it, things don't work? So even before I became a, an Adventist, this voice was speaking to me to honor the Sabbath. Before I even became an Adventist, I disobeyed it. I was running a business which never worked. Come Sabbath, it was terrible. Until my wife actually says, you know what? This Sabbath thing, let's not involve these workers. Let's send them away. Mm. So it was a growth, a process of growing up. That's right. And now... This voice speaks to me even when I go into the supermarket. I can forget something. The voice will speak to me and I'll go back and pick it up. That's good. I don't carry a list. I don't do anything. It constantly speaks to me and uh, I listen. Thank that's you. good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to hear some, someone else as well. But as, as we're getting ready to just hear from um, Sister Doriel, um, remember as we studied um, with, with, with Job, um, it was this process. For Job to be able to declare, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, it was a process. It was a process with Abraham as well and growing. And this is what we have to understand to be able to get to the voice, the place, sorry, that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us. We have to abide and spend time with him and learn from these uh, experiences. Good morning, Sister Doria. Let's have your point. Good morning. I just want to follow up on Brother Fibian, well, he, Elder Fibian, should I say what he had said. If, as Christians, we say that we believe in God and we love him and we pray every day to him and ask him to look after us when we leave the house, mm. then we need to listen to that voice. Mm. When I haven't listened to the voice, I've been in trouble. Mm. And when I do listen to the voice, one time I was driving and I could see this lorry coming from the side road and I was about to stop. But a voice said to me, don't stop. And I didn't stop. And as I drove past, he just careered into me, but behind me. And because I'd listened to that voice, it seemed as though my guardian angel had covered me over because all the glass came speeding into the car, passed me and went to the passenger side at the front of me, at the front of the, the um, car. In the end, also what happened was it, it pushed me into the line of traffic and I stopped to just a little, little space in front of the car that was in front of me. And she jumped out of her car and said, oh, no, I saw what happened. And she said, if I 
um, want, she will be able to help me with the police. Mm. But anyway, my point is that we need to listen to God. When we listen to God, that small voice, we are always protected because I came out of that car with no injuries. The car was a complete write-off and people couldn't believe how I got out of the car without mm. any injuries. Mm. But as I say, I'm sure my guardian angel covered me with his wings or her wings because I didn't get a scratch on me. Amen. Powerful testimony. Thank you both. Thank you. Sister Marcia, coming back to you. Sorry, share with any examples coming in of where people have worked successfully together with God or any other comments for us? Thanks. Yes, I've got a few comments coming in more on YouTube than on live stream, but hopefully live stream will send us, people on live stream will send us a few comments as well. So Pastor Smith says in relation to the sixth sense, he says, my grandmother was able to see right through me <laughs> and often predicted what I was doing or had done. Mm. Naughty pastor. <laughs> <laughs> El Chico says, there was a moment I wanted to walk out of this particular sin. Initially, I felt I could do it on my own by putting in the effort, but upon persistent failure, I asked God to empower me and a victory gain. So, amen. Um, in terms of El Chico gaining victory there. Um, the question is asked, do we sometimes downplay the Holy Spirit speaking to us as a sixth sense? The problem is we often override the Holy Spirit speaking and then justify why we are going to do what we do. Tom Tom says, the sixth sense is the sense of perception or discernment that enables us to see through things or read between the lines. Some have more of it than others. I guess it's a gift from God. Um, another thought. Often I have a deep instinct not to do something. Anytime I go against this, I always regret it. Similar to what Doria was saying. Person goes on to say, I have learned that it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me when I'm do." When whatever I'm doing, I wrestle with it, seeking God's guidance. Um, another question from another comment, sorry, from Juliet Wainwright. She says, I was a bench warmer for so long. I closed my ears to the promptings of the Holy Spirit who wanted me to do his bidding. When I decided to conquer my fears and be receptive, the Holy Spirit was allowed to do his work in me. And so then she then goes on to say, divine and human working together. Mm. Jennifer Morgan says, the same goals that the devil finds work for idle hands. And she cites David. David knew he was wrong. He was informed that um, Bathsheba was a wife of one of his soldiers. Yet at, at the end of the day, he made his choice. Kenneth Morgan says, self-discipline is vital. How shall a person cleanse his or her thoughts and then offers a solution? Choose to do what is acceptable to God, i.e. keep his commandments and follow the paths that lead to righteousness. El Shiko says the more we succumb to temptations, the lesson the voice of the spirit becomes. The more we overcome the temptations, the more power we gain for subsequent temptations mm. and then says what a trajectory mm. um let's see what else other goodies have we got here ah alicia says to hear the voice of god we've got to build a relationship we will then know his voice yes. and in knowing his voice we will then understand what god is saying to us Amen. and bev blake says um my part was telling a friend of the love of god and what he did for me and God work with me and the result was her friend's heart was not only convicted but her friend surrendered to God Amen. Amen. Jennifer Morgan says you have to be a good listener and know who is speaking why because there are so many voices but not only so many voices voices that sound true voices that sound convincing but voices that can be so, so wrong. And Gugu says, I was 15. My parents couldn't afford school fees. I was asked to be a nun so all my fees could 
be paid. She said that she declined because a small voice said no, and the fees that were outstanding was paid off anyway by a different set of people. And the final comment from Dwayne, he says, we need to remember God speaks to us via our conscious, and most of us don't know this. Also, God speaks in many ways in, through impressions, through dreams, through direct voice, his word, and via others. And I think I've got one comment from live stream. And Alana says, the more we focus on God's voice, the dimmer the things of the earth will be. Amen. And that's all the comments that we got. Great comments. Apologies for the background noise there. But thank you. Keep those thoughts and comments coming in. We really appreciate that. Here's another question for you. How can I know if I am basing my choice on feelings or desires as opposed to the Word of God? We kind of answered this already, but I'll still put the question out there. How can I know, how can you know, if you're basing your choice on feelings or desires as opposed to the Word of God? So if you haven't answered that question already, send us your comments and answers. So the Bible speaks about men and women that would not be bought, sold, or swayed. God wants them to be committed to him. God wants us to be committed to him. So, Pastor, coming back to you, in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, he tells us about true commitment. Um, Matthew 5, verses 29 through to 30. If you could just read and comment on those verses, please. Most certainly. And it reads, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, um, if we are to look at it literally, one would see that God is very harsh. And, um, but the words that are spoken here are metaphoric and symbolic, meaning God has to um, enable some um, situations to occur to save our very soul. And um, I have a sermon called A Radical Sacrifice for a Radical Savior. God has to um, enforce some radical situations to make a drastic change in our lives. And because he, he sees um, where we are going, the road that we are leading to, and he basically says there are some things that we have within us as human beings that will deter us from our eternal destination. And God even goes as far as to say, whatever that thing is, I will remove it just to save you. Even if it means to remove you from that relationship or remove you from even that job that you might be in, whatever it is that might be a deterrent to your salvation, I will remove it for the greater good to save your soul. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Just thinking about that a little more, Sita, coming to you. Now, working in healthcare, your profession is to look after the health and well-being of those that uh, come into the hospital or wherever you're working. So what's your take, though, on this directive to, to maim oneself uh, if a, a body organ offends? Just, you know, in your view, how do you expand on that, please? Yeah, so um, there's a lot going on. So um, there are different organ systems in the human body that contribute to the functioning of the entire body. And each organ has a unique function that coordinates and keeps the body healthy. 
And um, every organ is dependent on the other. For example, if the digestive system is impaired, it can affect the organs like the kidneys. Um, so after one system shuts down um, or damaged, the others would slowly start to shut down as well until the body can no longer maintain homeostasis. So thankfully, Jesus meant it metaphorically speaking, and we don't need to mutilate our bodies as a punishment for our sin, but rather... Jesus means that we should um, be prepared to make exceptional sacrifices if we want to follow him. Yes, indeed. When I was thinking about this aspect, um, as Marcia mentioned at the very start, um, the UK at the moment is hosting the Commonwealth Games. Um, in the Commonwealth Games, the athletes that are para-athletes, in other words, they suffer disability they are competing alongside the able-bodied athletes. There was a particular female swimmer that the story went that um, she voluntarily um, had one of her legs amputated because the leg was not functioning properly anyway, but it was slowing her down where it came to swimming. So she chose to have this leg removed so it enabled her that when she is swimming, she can go faster. She's not carrying a dead leg, so to speak, if you excuse the pun. You know, it's a big thing when you think about it, but there's a message there that clearly where there was something that was preventing her from achieving the goal that she wanted to achieve, in her case, which is swimming faster, she then took that decision to have that removed. I mean, as, as both um, Sita and Pastor Andres have said here, God does not want us to mutilate ourselves, but clearly there is a message here that where something is preventing you from going on, from going and achieving what God wants us to achieve, we need to cut that off. It's not talking about mutilation, but it's recognizing that we need to um, put things aside. But, you know, good examples there. Thanks for expanding on that. Um, let me come back to you, Sister Marcia. Um, there was a question on the floor. How can I know if I'm basing my choices on feelings or desires? Are there any, any answers to that or anything else coming in, please? Yeah, I've got a couple of answers on that question. Uh, Liz Clark says, I know if my choices are based on the word of God by prayers, I'm waiting for, uh, sorry, let me start again. I know if my choices are based on the words of God by prayers and waiting for his answers instead of going by my feelings as well as my, my desires. Ruby says, God wants us to cut out anything, absolutely anything that causes us to continually sin because he wants us all to be saved. He does not expect us to be literally deforming our bodies. Mm. Um, Juliet says, God's law and his word are there to guide us and lead us into all truth. If our feelings and desires are not in line with God's word, then we have fallen off the straight and narrow. And um, Pastor Smith picks up on a point that um, Pastor Malcolm made. He says, Reflecting upon what pa Pastor Malcolm said, the key issue, what do you value most? How committed, he asked the question, how committed am I to become spiritual and experience righteous changes? Mm -hmm. And the point he makes is that we need to let go of dead weight. Mm -hmm. El Chico says, as long as the feelings and the desires conflict with the word of God, it shows that our choices just hinges on feelings. The spirit can also speak to us when we are at the point of making those choices. Um, and Leslie says, severing a body part reveals how important it is to sacrifice our own desires. Mm. Sacrifice is critical to the death of self for God to be revealed. Man's heart and thoughts can be trusted. Self must die. And Estelle says, feelings changes, but the word of God lasts forever. And Lynette says, God has given us, his children, specific instructions and guidelines in his word. 
When my choices and actions are in direct opposition to God's, then life does not go well. Mm. And Tony says, the encouraging point is also that God is the potter. We indeed are the clay. He knows what to cut out and how to cut out the necessary. Um, on, live, on live stream, Alana says, when God wants to evaluate your spiritual growth, you will feel uncomfortable. Certain friendships will cease. It can be a lonely experience. But he, God, said, I am with you always. And then she says, how comforting. Mm. And those are all the comments that I've great, got so far, great Johnny. Great points, great comments. Please keep them coming in. Let me go out with one more question for our listeners and viewers. Um, can you share some practical ways to guard well the avenues to your soul? When you think about the situation of Eve that we touched on, what was it that led her to eventually take the fruit and eat? When we think of David, what was it that made him, made um, enable Bathsheba them to come into the palace. Think about that story, yeah? So here's my question. Share some practical ways to guard well the avenues to your soul. Look forward to hearing those. Um, so for me, a Bible character that epitomizes struggling with all energy is, of course, Jacob. So, so let's, let's set the scene very quickly. If you remember, Jacob left the family home because he tricked his brother into receiving the birthright. And Esau was not happy. In fact, Esau was angry. Roll forward many years. He's, he dreamt his dream of the ladder reaching heaven. He'd, 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 he'd had um, the children of Israel, children of Jacob, which became the children of Israel. He's now heading back home. But his fear, his greatest fear was that he was going to now meet his, his brother. And he went apart to pray. So, Sister Seat, if I can come to you. Um, as we know, the Bible went on to say that Jacob wrestled effectively with, with, with Jesus, with God. Um, I don't know if you've ever wrestled um, with God, like Jacob. But what do you personally learn from Jacob's encounter? Yeah, so um, I definitely feel like I have wrestled with God. I think many of us have in different um, situations. Um, one, one of them being calling me to be a panelist. I didn't feel qualified. I would think, why is God choosing me? Um, trying to process what he's calling me to do has been a journey. But he reminds me daily that he wouldn't ask of me anything that I can't handle. He humbles me and makes me realize that it's not about me, but it's about who he can reach through me. Mm. So similarly from Jacob's encounter, we can take away that often we only see our natural circumstances and forget there's a spiritual reality that oversees them. Um, in this story, God pulls back the curtain. Jacob's struggles was not only with Esau, it was also with God and with himself. God wanted to change Jacob through his difficulties and God had always been wrestling with Jacob, seeking to get his will done in his life. Similarly, God has always been lovingly wrestling with us, seeking our submission to his will and kingdom. Indeed, indeed. Um, Andres, coming to you. Now, as a pastor, I imagine you may have had some debates with God, let's say, and I know you know, you've had your own challenges. I, I just wanted to give you some time to just share anything to encourage um, us in, in, in terms of the need to persevere. I'll, over to you, sir. Uh, you, 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 you've touched a very um, interesting uh, topic. They, many, many times we debate with God um, and protest. I remember two years ago, I was 
severely unwell. And I remember looking at the four walls of the hospital, asking God or saying to God, why am I here? Why am I in this situation? I'm a young man. Why am I, why am I going through this? I mean, what is the purpose of me going through this? And, you know, when you're in those kind of situations, um, you question God, you, 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 sometimes you think, you know, life is unfair. Uh, my, my son would have just been born two months prior to me being sick. And, um, you know, I was very upset, very frustrated, and so many things was got running through the mind. But the assurance that I received from God said, what you're going through now will be a testimony to enrich somebody's life later. And it is through going through that experience I really understood God's love, his grace, and his healing power. Mm. So we can really truly say that in the midst of the storm, God had the power to calm my storm and to bring peace in a troubled mind. Mm. And, I, and, and I'm very grateful that two years now, I'm in the best health best shape I've ever been in a long time. And through that experience, I would say many have come to Christ through that testimony. Mm, mm, thank you. If I may, just going back to um, Jacob's situation. Um, you know, he, he was there, he set himself um, aside from the family because he went there now to... To, to pray and to agonize with God. He didn't expect a stranger was going to, to, to be there. And initially then, uh, bearing in mind where his mindset was, thinking about what is happening, his brother's on, a, on his way with 400 men, etc. So now there's this person, he didn't know who this person was. And he's now wrestling with this person. But here's the point now. His hip gets touched or if you like his his hip is dislocated he's in pain now at this point surely that's where you kind of say i surrender and and and, and give up but no um they, uh, jacob sorry clings on and what does he say because he recognizes now who he's wrestling with he recognizes that and he clings on and he says Unless you bless me, I'm not going to let go. Now that takes a particular person, because he, he was having mental trauma, if you like, up until that point. But now he's having physical trauma because he's feeling the pain. So when you think of that journey, it's like, you know, uh, have we been in that situation? I, I think Elder Fibian wants to make a point so while he gets ready for this. But when you think of that situation, this crucible, because after all, that's what it's talking about. Last week we spoke about extreme heat. So now uh, Jacob is experiencing not only this mental trauma, but he's now experiencing the physical trauma. Um, Elder Fibian, let me not take away whatever you want to share at this time. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Elder. In the presence of divinity, when, when you are in the presence of divinity, it's different from being in the presence of another man. If Christ comes in this room where we are, we feel different. Whereas if we are in a, another room where there's no Christ, it's a different situation. So... Jacob must have felt divine presence and held on to divine presence to surrender all the challenges that he had, the fears for his brother Esau and whatever issues he had. This is why perhaps he pronounced to say, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. Mm. And not only that, the Lord spoke to him. In that struggle, there was communication. Yeah? There was communication. It's almost getting to daylight. Mm. So he knew what was going on in that restaurant. 
even in us in our lives as well, we get into those crucibles. We all are going through crucibles, or we've gone through crucibles, or we will go through crucibles. But uh, as long as we stay within the realms of divinity, mm. we will overcome. Mm. Thank you. Powerful point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, keen to hear your thoughts on that as well. And it's that message there about when things are really boiling over. It's remembering that Christ is, is, is the vessel. Christ is the crucible vessel. So he's taking that heat. So we need to stay in there so that we can be purified and, and brought closer uh, to God and to, to get us to that position. When we think of um, as Elder Peter, when he demonstrated that, you know, the extreme heat, that's the time when you get the pure gold. So uh, that's my prayer for all of us, that we cling and we stay firm and committed to um, what God has set us to do and whatever challenges that we are facing. Sister Marcia, let me come back to you for our final online comments, please. Sure. On the live stream, um, Alana, in, in, in response to the practical ways to guard the avenues to our soul, um, Sister Alana says, it can be very lonely sometimes, um, but there are friendships that cease as one's spiritual walk with God grows. Uh, Karen says, we need to think about what we watch, what we listen to, the places that we go to. Sometimes we don't realize the impact of what we take in is that, um, sorry, sometimes we don't realize the impact of what we take in is what will come out, sometimes unintentionally. And in terms of, of YouTube, we've got uh, Liz Clark says, I have, been, I have been through the mental and physical trauma and never understand why, but God knows best. Sometimes it's not for us to understand, but for us to keep trusting God, no matter what comes our way. Mm. El Shiko says, there are moments, there's a feeling of a severe disconnection with God. Despite confessing, you still feel the, rec the reconciliation isn't complete. They go on to say, we go the extra mile of needing further assurances. Beth Blake says, to guard the soul, we've got to study the word of God. Mm -hmm. Pray daily and find ways to help others and also live the way that Christ lived in love and unity. In all this, we can guard our soul. And uh, Leslie says, David's story doesn't tell of his conscience wrestling to do good over evil. We can take it that, we, that he, he did as human would, but David allowed his, um, his, David allowed his member to let him sin, a sin which runs far and deep. Mm. Another person says, um, did Jacob know he was going to wrestle with God because he sent his family away? That's a question. Mm. Alicia says, once our choice is not lining up with God, we have to let go of the things that is not of him. And in, in terms of um, your, your question, Johnny, God into the avenues of the soul, um, one of the things that I use is, is to sing. I mean, my voice is so terrible, I'm sure it would, sc it would scare away the devil anyway. <laughs> but when those suggestions mm. come to mind, my favorite hymns like the Blessed Assurance, Amen. Jesus is mine, uh, as some of the, the those those hymns that just touch the soul yes. is for me to hold on to and knowing that this suggestion I can overcome it. Amen. Thank you very much for your comments. We've come to the time where we have to leave. It's time for your takeaway points, Sister Sita. Can you share your takeaway point with us, please? Um, so for me, it's it's simple. God is a merciful God and he wants to be there for us every step of the way, regardless of how big or small the situation may be. Um, we only have to trust and believe in him. Amen. Thank you very much. And Pastor Andres. Yes, um, just to uh, state that there is no victory without struggle. Mm. And it's through the struggle of life 
God will enable us to be victorious over the obstacles that we face. Amen. Thank you. And Sister Marcia. In the word of God, in the word of God are represented two contending parties that influence and control human agencies in our world. Let us desire to be in harmony with the heavenly agencies so that we will earnestly do God's will and let us constantly be on guard so that we are not overcome by the enemy. Amen. Thank you very much. The song says, fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. We want to thank God for blessing us with his presence and for his word. Thank you so much for your contributions today. Special shout out to all of those tuning in. Thank you so much, Sister Marcia. Sister Sita, and big thanks to Pastor Andres. I know your Sabbath day has started extra early, sir. Make sure you don't drop to sleep in the sermon. Hopefully you're not preaching yourself today. But we just want to thank you so much for your contributions. And thanks to our AV team for their hard work as ever. Next week, by God's grace, indestructible hope. But please stay tuned for our divine service, which is going to follow shortly. Let us bow our heads as we bring our Sabbath school to a close. Lord, we want to thank you so much that you have given us the strength that we need to be able to overcome the challenges that we face. So please, dear Father, as we study these lessons, help us to understand and apply them to our lives so that we can be victorious through you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.